The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. What can I tell you about Kate White that you don't already know? She's a firecracker and a dynamo. I was the editor of Cosmopolitan magazine for 14 years. She knows everything there is to know about sex, romance, and love. But then she is also a mystery and suspense writer. She has published six Bailey Weggins mysteries and four suspense novels, including Eyes on You, which is coming out in paperback this month. And I think we may have copies in the back. Um, we may not. Uh, so it's coming out this month. Her next novel, The Wrong Man, will be published in June, and The Mystery Writer's Cookbook, which she edited, will be published in March. When she is not writing or editing books, Kate speaks or appears on TV shows like The Today Show or my show, The Lewis Burke Fremke Show, where you hear all the fine speakers. Or she blogs or writes a newsletter. The words dervish and phenom suddenly spring to mind. Kate is refreshing, precocious, gorgeous, and exciting. What more could you want in a speaker for Hunter College? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present to you this evening the editor and best-selling author, Kate White. Thank you, Lewis. I'll try to be a Dervis. Uh, when Lewis told me and warned me that you know he had a good sign up, but things fell off because of the rain typically here, I was reminded of this incident that happened to me where I had gone to see Susan Taylor, the fabulous editor of Essence, even though there was a blizzard. And I just felt, I, I just want to be supportive. I want to go. And there was just a handful of people there. But a couple of years later, this book publishing company that bought my book said, oh, we were really influenced by someone in the PR department who sat next to you at a Susan Taylor lunch. So good karma for those of you who came, so thank you. I want to start with a little confession tonight. Yes, I'm the woman who wrote those crazy Cosmo cover lines, like mattress moves so hot, his thighs will go up in flames. So what am I doing up here tonight? I'm sure there have just been some wonderful literary writers who have spoken here, and I'm sure not one of them. But if you're interested in writing, and if you've, you've thought about could you at any particular stage of the game make a career as a writer, I have some interesting perspectives I could throw out there. I didn't write my first novel till I was in my late 40s. And so anyone who's thinking, gee, is there still time for me? I'm living proof that there is. I also, having worked in the magazine business, have been exposed to a lot about publishing that I have uh, just been, can bring a, a point of view on. And also, I was lucky enough to make money as, an, as a writer. And so if anyone wants to know anything about can you really, as crass as it may sound, write and make a living doing it, I can share some points of view on that too. I thought what I'd do is just tell you a little bit about my background because I know when I go to hear writers talk, I'm curious about how they got from A to B. And then I thought I would share just 10 quick thoughts about writing. And if anyone had any questions, then I would tackle them at the end. I always wanted to be a writer when I was growing up from the time I was just a little girl. And I remember this one incident that happened when I was in first grade. The teacher had told us to write something down. And of course, in first grade, you're not writing in a ver very sophisticated way. But it was a very clear assignment. And yet, I did something totally different than what she told us to do. I, I wrote a little story about my grandfather taking me to see the ducks and one of the ducks kind of flying up in his face and it amused me. And even as I was writing the story, I thought, I am not doing what the teacher told us to do. It was just a very specific thing about putting words down. But I felt so compelled anyway to 
to do that. Well, the next day we get our things back and my mine isn't among them. And I thought, boy, I'm in trouble here. But a little while later, the teacher asked me to come up to the front of the class and read my little story to the class. And then she asked me to go and read it to the other two first grades. And then she mounted it on a piece of purple construction paper, which I still remember, and she hung it in the front of the class. What a wonderful teacher, right? I mean, just, I mean, just thinking of it knocks things out of my hands. It was just uh, so amazing for her to do. But uh, that kind of giddy uh, reinforcement I got and just, wow, this really hooked me to know this could be the reward from writing, that it wasn't just about something that made you feel good inside, but it was the praise and the um, uh, just the support from the outside. And, and I, I love that. And I guess that's when I was hooked. I wrote all through school, through high school, and I did a variety of things like be yearbook editor. I wrote a play that was on and put on in my high school uh, when I was 14. I put out a little magazine. And what I, I never understood at the time was that there were really just all sorts of separate types of writing. But to me, it was all just about being a writer. And it didn't occur to me till I got to be probably in high school, getting ready to go away to college, that I realized, well, I can't be all these kinds of writers. I can't be a newspaper reporter, playwright, a magazine editor, and all of these things. And I was going to have to somehow uh, separate that. And when I was in college, my school asked me to be their representative to the Glamour Magazine Top Ten College Women Contest. And I ended up winning, being on the cover, which my brothers referred to as trick photography. <laughs> and that, I realized, kind of made the decision for me because this was going to be a ticket into the magazine business. And I came to New York right after graduation on a night very much like tonight. It was raw and cold out. And I came to the train station upstate New York. My brother brought me. And I was going to come to New York and make my fortune in the magazine business, I hoped. And my brother ended up talking to this older gentleman. And the next thing you know, he's pulling this guy over. And he says, Cater, this guy's going to keep, this guy's gentleman's going to keep an eye on you on the train. I'm like, oh, Jim, come on. Well, the guy stuck to me like a Velcro hair roller. He, he cups my elbow and he helps me onto the train. And then he sits right next to me. And I'm so embarrassed. And before long, I noticed people are kind of staring at us. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe they're wondering what the connection is because he was much older, obviously different ethnic backgrounds. So they're probably wondering they're not related, too old to be her boyfriend. And finally, I got up to go to the bathroom. On my way back, I noticed he had an emblem on his blazer. I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a school thing. But as I got closer, I saw it said Green Haven Correctional Facility. <laughs> And I realized people think I'm a prisoner being transported <laughs> to a downstate facility. So I often think I came this close to arriving in Manhattan in handcuffs. But I, I made my way in the magazine business. And in my early years, I did a lot of feature writing. One of my big pieces was my night at a sex toy party for Glamour magazine. But over time, you begin to discover that if you're going to keep making it as an editor, you can't be a feature writer, too. You have to let go of that and really be about the management and the production of it. So I wrote less and less, and I ended up with uh, running a number of different magazines. And finally, I was the editor of Red Book. And, um, I just felt something was missing. And uh, one day I was sort of spending a little time, my kids were little, but I'd taken a cup of coffee up to our, our barn in Pennsylvania and was thinking a little bit about things. And I realized I do not want to go to my grave not having written Murder Mystery. Not sure why. There's an old joke someone told me once that to me kind of sums it up. A woman goes into a fortune teller, hands a woman $20, and says, please read my palm. And the fortune teller looks at the palm and says, oh, I, I can't read it. And she goes, why not? She said, it, it's just too awful. So the fortune teller says, um, or the woman says to the fortune teller, please, I can take it. I just need to know. So the fortune teller says, OK, I see a man 
lying in a pool of blood. He's got about 70 stab wounds. And I think it's your husband. And the woman thinks for a minute, and then she looks at the fortune teller and says, just one question, will I be acquitted? <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that joke kind of summed up what I loved about murder mysteries. Did she do it? Why did she do it? Will she be acquitted? And, but I just knew I wanted to write a murder mystery. So I set time aside every Saturday to try to do that, and I got four chapters out. Well, all of a sudden, one Sunday, just to the point where I'd reach the four chapters, I was the editor of Red Book. I got a call on a Sunday from my boss saying, Kate, can you drive into the city? We have something to tell you today. I was, oh, when your boss calls you on a Sunday, your legs get really, really wobbly. And I said to my husband, boy, I am not the editor of Red Book anymore, but I don't know what I am. Get to the office, and my boss, to my shock, says to me, we want you to be the new editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan. I had not seen that coming at all. And of course, as a good corporate citizen, I had to say yes. Didn't even have a cell phone then. This was probably 18 years ago. So I get home, and I said to my husband, you are not going to believe it. I'm the new editor of Cosmo. And he gets this kind of grin on his face. And he looks at me, and he goes, wait. I'm going to bed tonight with the editor of Cosmo. I, I think he thought they'd handed me the Kama Sutra at the, at the meeting and said, learn every position in here between now and Monday. But unlike him, I just wasn't enchanted by the idea. Not only was Cosmo not something I was familiar with all that much, but I had this mystery I had wanted so much to do and I was already into it. Well. Cosmo was, a, it's, was the number one magazine on newsstands. It's number three now, but that's not my problem. But I, I had to devote all my attention to it, and I had to let the mystery go. But about six months later, over Christmas, I decided to just get it out from the drawer of those four chapters and take a look at it. And what was really funny, it was about a nanny who had been found dead by her employer. And in the draft, the nanny was found dead on a copy of Cosmopolitan. <laughs> and I thought, that's a sign from the heavens! I meant to tackle this book. So I got up really early every Saturday and Sunday, wrote for a couple of hours before the kids got up, and then wrote uh, again uh, before my staff got in at Cosmo. And I ended up um, having a lot of success with those Bailey Wagons novels. And as much as I love Cosmo, it was a fabulous job, there got to be a point where I really wanted to see what it would be like to live the writer's life and just have that kind of freedom. I guess in some ways I've always sort of felt a little bit like an outdoor cat and wanted to be away from the corporate structure. And a couple of years ago, I just said to my boss, I'm probably not going to renew after this two-year contract. And I'm, I'm sure he was a little bit shocked, but he understood. And they offered me some other jobs in the company, thinking maybe it was just I needed a change from Cosmo. But I just wanted to try it. And it's been unbelievably delicious for me to, to finally live the life of a writer. Uh, you know, the only downside about working for yourself is, you know, you realize that at times the boss is a bitch. But uh, other than that, I've, I've really enjoyed it. So that's how it happened for me, and it was not a straightforward way down, but I, I loved the idea that I managed to pull it out of the fire kind of late in the game, and I was probably close to 50 when that first book came out. So I put together just 10 little thoughts I had about writing, because I know there are at least a few of you here who have are doing it, are trying it, are wondering things about making it happen and bringing it to fruition. So I thought I'd share just these 10 points. And don't worry, they're short 10 points. The first is, I think you really have to figure out what your writer's cocktail is. And by that, I mean the ingredients that make writing both seductive and delicious for you. Because it is so hard to force your butt in that chair. 
And the more you do to make yourself want to get in that chair, the easier it's going to be. When I was in my 20s and wanted to write, I bought a roll-top desk for myself, put it in the living room, and told myself, I am going to write every single night. And I did not do that at all. And I would read these stories or, or hear authors talk about, if you're meant to write, you're going to sit down and do it. You don't procrastinate. You don't put it off. And I thought, I don't believe that. I think that I could write. I just don't know why I'm not. And I began to realize that that roll-top desk really felt constrictive for me. There's very little writing space. I had all those pigeonholes. And I finally changed my desk to a big flat top desk, and it made a huge difference for me. Then I started experimenting. I'm a total night owl. I hate going bed to bed before 1 o'clock, or at least I did then. But I realized I only write best in the morning. So it became a little like burning the candle at both ends, but I realized if I were going to write, I had to get up early and do it because that's when, for me, I felt in the zone. I experimented with different types of music, and I discovered that operas I was really familiar with, it became like white noise, and they were great for me to write by. And there's really a lot of interesting research that supports the need for this in the writer's life the need for a writer's cocktail. And another part of it is just ritual. Lisa Gardner, the thriller writer, says she always lights a candle before she starts writing. There's an interesting book called The Psychology of Writing by Ronald Kellogg, and he says environments, schedules, and rituals amplify, amplify performance. They become the cue for the desired behavior. So if you sometimes find yourself wanting to write but struggling to get started, I think finding your writer's cocktail can make a huge difference. Secondly, again, if you're having trouble starting, start very, very small. Even when I got all those ingredients of the writer's cocktail down, still had a hard time sitting in that chair. I'd actually tried some literary fiction in my 20s and was hopeless about doing it. And so when I made the decision to write the murder mysteries in my late 40s, I decided to use a time management trick that I discovered when I interviewed time management experts uh, over the years. And one of them was called Slice the Salami. And the guy who came up with the concept said that the reason that we often don't tackle tasks that we really long to do is because we make them too daunting for ourselves. And he believes if you trick the mind by slicing it in to smaller segments, the way you make a salami more appetizing, it's going to be easier to do. And what's interesting, not long ago, my uh, yoga teacher was telling me, she teaches aerobics, and she said that the people who sign up for three aerobics classes a week in January are far less likely to be with her in May than the ones who sign up for one. So when I started that first mystery, I wrote for only 10 minutes a day because I thought, that's my threshold. How could I not write for 10 minutes? But over time, it became easier and easier to, to expand it from 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And I, I really think it's a great way if you're having trouble getting started. In fact, I, I ran into a woman lately who had told me she had just finished her first novel after six years. And I said, wow, six years, how did you finally finish it? And she said, I heard a talk you gave a year ago where you said <laughs> write only 10 minutes a day, and she said that made all the difference. A third thought I wanted to share, read, learn, read lots more, listen to other writers, and read even more. Look, it goes without saying that if you want to write, you have to be a reader. And any time you, you listen to a, a wonderful writer, they're going to talk about how much they read. But I've also been a fan of just studying. And you know that's what the whole writing program is here at Hunter, what it's all about. And I've tried to use all sorts of different ways to keep learning about this, 
the, the art. Uh, there are wonderful books, as you know, like Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont and Stephen King's book on writing. I love to go to lectures. I just did a, hosted a, a four-part series called Secrets of Suspense at the Y with Harlan Coben and, and Lee Child and a few other uh, uh, suspense writers. And Harlan said something when I was interviewing him that, I, that really made me go back and look at some of my own writing. He said that, leave out every single thing that you tend to skip over when you read other writers. Now, look, that's mainly for suspense writers, but I realized that was worth taking in consideration for my own writing. I learned a great trick, too, from a, a, a lecture I heard where the, the person talking, the writer talking, said that a trick that worked for her was one of Hemingway's. And I looked it up, and Hemingway said that you always stop in the middle of writing something really, really good because it forces you to go back there the next day rather than uh, stopping at the end. Uh, one of the things that probably has helped me the most, and for any of you who are starting to write, uh, I learned a lot by reading everything I could about screenplays. The Sid Field book on screenplays has, has some wonderful information about structure where you look at the, the importance of the two plot points, the turning points, the, the one first usually occurs within the first, uh, at the end of the first 20% of the book. Uh, of the screenplay, but if it's uh, a book, you could use it too. So it would be, that's where the hero has the call, his call to action. So if you're looking at Star Wars, it would be when Luke comes back from and discovers that his family has been killed and he decides instead of leaving the unengaged life, he is going to take on the Empire. And just learning some of the techniques used in screenplays was really helpful as I thought about trying to, to develop structure in my own books. Four, but as much as it's important, I think, to study other writers and hear what they have to say and learn their techniques, in the end, you just have to learn, go by your own rules and live by those. That there's a real danger, I think, to getting too caught up in the way other writers say you have to do it. There's a book by Elizabeth George that's so didactic and so hardline as she describes what you need to do. And one of them is you always have to write a biography of your characters. Not everybody does that. You know, do you think Fitzgerald did that with Nick Carraway? I don't think so. Uh, have you ever read the Elmore Leonard 10 Rules About Writing that ran in the New York Times a number of years ago? Really fun to Google. And one of the rules was never begin a book with the weather. Another was never use a verb other than said when writing dialogue. Never use an adverb to modify said. Never use the word suddenly. And there's a lot to be learned from reading this little piece. But as Lee Child would say, you cannot get caught up in the other writer's rules. Figure out what you want your rules to be and live by them. And, and also that goes t as well to writing the kind of book you want to write and not what you're supposed to write. There's an interesting piece in Vanity Fair this month about Saul Bellow. And it talks about the turning point he had when he realized, as he was writing his third book, that he wasn't meant to write about existential woe, but instead to write about the things that sprung from his childhood and his original eyes, as he calls them. Number five. As Freud said, if inspiration does not come, go halfway to meet it. One of the big questions writers get asked all the time is where do you get your ideas from? And I've been fascinated by this as I've listened to other writers. Almost all suspense novelists I know keep a folder. Anything they come across about crime, even if they don't think it's going to be something they're going to tackle right then and there, they stick in the folder. And I've gotten some of my best ideas going back to my idea folder. 
even today, do you know Linda Fairstein? She's a, a terrific writer who writes crime novels. She was uh, head of the sex crimes prosecutor's office in Manhattan. And she writes about very unusual parts of the city in each of her books. And I saw something this afternoon about a part of New York I'd never seen before. So I just sent her a quick link to it. And I said, this is a little close to the book you did on Roosevelt Island, but I thought you'd be interested in it. And she said, oh, thanks so much. I actually saw an article about that that I clipped a year ago, and I even ordered the book. So there she is. She may not ever do anything about it, but it's in her clipping file. Another thing writers talk a lot about is the importance of just sort of paying attention and playing the what if game. So you see a glove lying on the ground and the game of what if the woman who left it there was in a hurry because she had some terrible emergency. What if the woman who left it there had just had her heart broken? You play that game. And uh, Harlan Coben's new book, The Stranger, is out, instant New York Times bestseller, number one. And he told me that he got the idea for the book because he saw a website called fakeapregnancy.com. And he thought, wow, what if you did something with that? What if you discovered that your wife had been on that website? What does that mean? And that's the whole basis for the book. So he's always playing what if. A great book on creativity is Twyla Tharp's book. And she talks about the technique of scratching for developing ideas, that you're always digging. And it might be reading, it might be changing locations, but she scratch, scratch, scratches for her ideas. Uh, Madeline Engel, one of the things she believed in was cross-pollination. And she got some of her best ideas. You know who she is? She wrote um, uh, A Wrinkle in Time, one of the great, great uh, children's book authors. And one of her, um, the things she used to read are th books on particle ph ph physics. And that cross-pollination, putting herself into a whole other area outside her comfort area, was where she got some of her best ideas. And lastly, kind of the kookiest idea that I ever heard, but one that I find has really worked for me, is to just put the idea out to the universe. I heard a nutty woman say this one day, Laura Day. She wrote a, a book called Practical Intuition. And she said that when you're looking for an idea, ask the question out loud. I want to write a novel, but what can I write about? I want to write a novel about a young woman growing up in New York, but what can be the dilemma that she faces? And you're, it plants a seed in your subconscious, and so often the idea will appear before your eyes. And that's happened to me over and over again. And tw I heard a lecture from Twyla Tharp, and she talks as well about how that had, has profoundly worked for her in, her in the dances she choreographs. Six you got to go big or go home. <laughs> I don't know, have you ever heard that expression? Yeah. I first heard it from this young woman who worked for me at Cosmo. And in her case, she was talking about Saturday night. And her point was, if you're going to go out on a Saturday night, you better be sure, you, uh, Annie, I can see you shaking your head, right? you got to be sure that your hair and your outfit and your clothes are to the max, because why bother doing it? And I always thought, boy, there's ramification, applications for this in so many areas of life. And I always taught my staffers at Cosmo to go big or go home. And I just thought this was interesting. This is a book, The Luckiest Girl Alive, that is coming out next month. And a former staffer of mine at Cosmo wrote it. And I was looking through the back. I'd read the book, and I loved it. And Reese Witherspoon just optioned it for a movie. Reese Witherspoon, who optioned Gone Girl, so this book is probably going to be huge and, huge. and somebody had said to me, oh, that's so nice what Jessica said to you about you in the back. And I hadn't even noticed in the acknowledgments, but she said, and to Kate White, teaching me to go big or go home. Now, she went bigger uh, or home with the topic of this book. And as the, her editor says, Jessica Knoll told me that she wanted to accomplish three things with her first novel develop a lead with a strong polarizing voice, work in some kind of newsy headline grabbing 
catastrophe and give it a heart. So she was going big with it. And I don't think you all always have to go big that way, but I think it is important to think in terms of going big, not so much with your plot, but what your theme is. Because books, novels aren't just plot. They're also theme. And the books that resonate for us have big themes, universal themes that are always there under the plot. And that's why they resonate for us. I was thinking the other day, I saw something on Robert Penn Warren. And one of my favorite books is, is All the King's Men. And if you just look on the surface, it's about corruption and how people who are victims of corruption are betrayed and lives are ruined. But really, the book, as Jack says, at the end is you open the envelope because the end of man is to know. You have to open the envelope. And that's the theme, and it's important when you're writing to not just think plot, but to think theme as well. Is it gonna be money can't buy happiness? <laughs> or money can buy happiness? But whatever, have your theme, and I think when you go big with those, that's the way that so often readers feel it really resonates for them. Seven, realize that in the end, I think voice and character count more than plot. I spent so much time in my early years as a writer really thinking about plot because I loved reviews that said, you never see the killer coming with Kate. She always makes it unexpected and you're slapping your head and thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't get it but I should have gotten. And, and that was important to me, but as I look back, it was really characters that I created that, and not all of them were this way, but the ones that were, were the ones that had, the, those were the books with the most impact. With my Bailey Wagons novels, women wrote to me every, dozens and dozens every week saying, I feel like I know Bailey. One woman said, I named my daughter after Bailey. And when we think of the great books that have influenced in our lives, whether it's Catcher in the Rye or whatever, it's always the voice of the character. And as much as plot is, is important, I think what you need to be working on the most is, is voice and character. Laura Lippman had a great idea when I interviewed her for The Why, because we talked a little bit about developing characters that are mem memorable and have strong voices. And she said that one trick she uses is she sometimes has her characters send her letters and tell her a secret that she doesn't know yet about them. I thought that was very interesting. Um, just uh, three more. Disdain the notion of writer's block. When you work in magazines, you never ever get writer's block. You can't afford to because you've got to meet a deadline. And the writers I've met who have come to writing novels from any kind of world that involves deadline, they never have writer's block. You just get it down. As Lee Child says, you don't get it right, you get it written. And you can always go back and work on it from there. Now, to be really crass, this is number nine. If you want to make money as a writer, kind of ignore what I said about following your instincts and writing what you feel compelled to write. And think a, bit, a little bit about not just what you want from the world, but what the world wants from you. I think it's important to think a little bit about the marketplace and understand what genre are you going to be in. Is it a genre that has a growth aspect to it? You don't want to be following the trends, though, look, Girl on a Train, the new Gone Girl, instant New York Times number one bestseller, but I do think there's a value in looking at what people are hungry for, if you want to make money. If you just want to write that book, about the violin player based on the guy who taught you when you were growing up and it's going to do you a world of good to do it, fine. But if, you, if you're going to be, think of it as a career, you do have to think a bit ruthlessly about that. 
Lee Child told me that when he was starting to write, he got fired from the television business, and when he decided to write a book, he researched the field of thrillers. And he said, okay, Michael Conley's already writing about a cop, and so-and-so's writing this, but there's nobody writing about the lone warrior, the guy who's out there all by himself, without a home, just always on the move, and that's how he decided on Jack Reacher, because he decided to fill a void in the marketplace. Is that too crass? <laughs> and lastly, speaking of being crass, if you really want to become a success as a writer, more and more today, it's important to really think about yourself as a marketer. It wasn't necessary at one time. I mean, people like Jacqueline Suzanne, some of you may be familiar with, she created the book tour. She, she was one of the first people to market in a certain way. But with all the competition and with the fragmentation of the marketplace, with what's happening in the book industry, the more you do to market yourself as an author, the better your chances are going to be for success. I was looking today, just before I came over here, one of my favorite authors is Sue Miller. She has no website. But Julian Barnes, have any of you read Sense of an Ending? Just a glorious, fantastic book. He won the Booker Prize. He's got a website. Martin Amos has a website. People who 20 years ago, if, they, if they'd been writing then, and I guess they were, would not have had websites they would not have seen that as necessary. But it's really important to think about that for yourself. And one thing that's emerging, I'll just say in the end, is that there are a lot of research that's come out of self-published authors that have shown the way they drive sales, and some of them big sales, is not by social media, though you want, you want that in the mix. It's not by Twitter, it's not by Facebook, but it's by the email list they create of their fan base. Because you drive, you use Facebook and use social media to drive to your website, you have them sign up, you give them a, uh, some reason to sign up for your newsletter. Maybe it's just getting, um, news from you about when your books come out. Maybe it's a free short story you wrote, but you harness those email names, uh, email addresses, and those are the people who respond when you do the next book. And there are tons of case studies today that show that this is the way that books get on the bestseller list. So again, Maybe it's not the, the most wonderful thing to say about being a writer, but I think it's so important to be aware of. So for any of you who are thinking about writing now, putting a book together early on, get a website going. Start building your fan base, your email list, because those are going to be the people who buy your book in the future. So those are my 10 little thoughts on writing, and if anyone had any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Yeah, that was amazing. That was wonderful. Um, I, I saw something this morning, I didn't read the article, but uh, something about Meryl Streep it started some kind of a thing, donated a lot of money to help, uh, I think it's women over a certain age, to write. Mm. Uh, did anybody else see that or read it? No? No, no. Yeah, but anyway, I just thought I'd mention it. But yeah. It was, yeah. Well, and, and to get, uh, 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 I guess, parts for women, too, maybe hopefully in there. I remember how much she applauded uh, at the Academy yes, Awards, yes. yes. Well, it's interesting because I uh, write nonfiction as well. I've written several books on, on leadership related to uh, my career. And 
every time somebody like More Magazine or uh, there are a couple of other websites reprints any article I did for women in their 50s, it drives tons of traffic to my website. And I think women in their 50s are incredibly hungry for not only great books to read, because they are the readers, uh, but also anything that guides them in, in how to have a great second half of their lives. So anyone here toying with the idea of writing anything for women in that age group, that is a really ripe audience. I thought it was also interesting that you said that reading about um, screenplays would help writing uh, books also. Yeah, I, I think it's incredibly interesting to look at it because it helps you, particularly when you're first starting out, to come up with some concepts for structure. There's a great example. One, one site I love is called Story Fix by Larry Brooks. It's a fantastic site with lots of great posts. And one of the examples he gives is he's a believer that right before the first plot point, that sort of hero's call to action, you do this kind of pinch that throws a little bit of a curveball in there. And one example he gives is there's a man. He's a research scientist. And unexpectedly, his wife dies. And he feels a little guilty about it because he's been having a little bit of a flirtation with a woman he works for, wor works with. And you think that's the plot point, that the hero's call to action is going to be related to losing his wife. But that's not the plot point, the first plot point. The first plot point is when the woman he's had the flirtation with tells him, I murdered your wife, I set it up to look like you did it, and unless you enter in a relationship with me, I'm going to have you exposed as a killer. So when you, when you get some of this uh, information on doing screenplays, it can be very helpful in terms of thinking about writing a novel and just structuring it, because a lot of it goes back to playwriting, too, in the three acts. Well, that's a question. If you had the choice again, would you still go the corporate route, or would you rather stay start as a writer your whole career? Good yeah, that's such a good question. You play a dangerous game because you don't know how long you're going to live. And I think today we do, for the most part, live long enough to be serial achievers. So you could say, down the road, I might want to try something else. And I was always hedging my bets. I didn't want to live the life of a writer early on because I felt I, I, I didn't have a family that could support me. Uh, my parents didn't have the money to do that. I, I didn't see. I was very bad as, as a waitress, so I, I couldn't see uh, doing that. And the idea was always, what if I try to do this at some point, make enough money so that I could leave? And that's what happened for me. And yet, uh, when I left at, you know, in my early 60s, I was taking a chance because you don't know how much time you have left. So I would say that let your gut be a guide that if you feel, you know what, I want to do this so badly, I don't mind waitressing, then go for it. But I will tell you that so many of the writers I know, at least in the mystery suspense category, wrote a lot of books before they left. Linda Fairstein had written, I think, maybe 12 books, 10 or 12 books before she left the prosecutor's office. Laura Lippman was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun. I think she wrote eight books. So it is great to have a little bit of security. And I, I think by being smart about how you manage your time, you can pull it off. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we'll take one more if you want to ask it. And then Kate is going to go back where she has a variety of books, <laughs> some of her mystery, some of her thrillers, some of her advice books. You, you probably will enjoy them. She'll be happy to inscribe them to you. But last question. 
I have a question about <clears throat> Cosmopolitan magazine. I mean, I used to read it when I came to New York. How do you think that's affected women and the women's, you know, it, it, pros, cons, both, neither, one? Yeah, well, of course, uh, Cosmo has been a lightning rod at times. But when you're in there, you discover it has the most passionate, gutsy, together readership I've ever encountered. One of the things, there are a couple people over the years who did PhDs looking at Cosmopolitan as a force in our culture. And Helen Gurley Brown, as, as much as a dynamo as she was, and really turned it into a billion dollar, incredibly successful brand that, well, there's 64 editions now around the world. It, and it funded everything else that the Hearst Corporation did. They used the cash to buy part of ESPN, part of um, ABC Lifetime, just hugely successful. The magazine under Helen did have a, a little bit of a throwback feeling, and yet, for a lot of young women in the 70s and 80s who were a little scared of feminism, who thought it meant you've got to choose the guy or to be a feminist, Cosmo, some research showed, really let women think they could have both. Now, when I got to Cosmo, as a feminist, I just couldn't do the breathless stuff. And so uh, I had Mika Brzezinski do my career column. I, I did away with every single diet story we ever did. Did away with anything on plastic surgery. We were anti-breast implants. Maybe you could tell why by looking at me. Um, but anyway, I, I just felt it was my opportunity to sort of put my own stamp on Cosmo. And as far as the sex stuff, you know, people used to say, oh, it's about pleasing guys. But we were all about sex really is the glue of a relationship. It's so important. And women need, just as we became better parents by reading parenting articles and parenting books, I think that we become better partners by understanding about how, you know, <coughs> sexual gratification for ourselves and our partners. And the young women who, who wrote to me at Cosmo, it was always, thank you for empowering me to take on the world. Thank you for making my relationship better. The readers were the most dynamic group of women around. So I think looking from the outside, Cosmo could look like a place that seem to pander sometimes, but from the inside, the, the women just love the message. And boy, it was fun to work there, let me tell you. I felt most of the time I was in it like in a television show. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Feel no under uh, obligation to buy a book. I'm just so grateful that you came. And as I said, good karma to all of you. <laughs> thank you.